I'm going to come up and sit with you. Yesterday we had a sit down with a candidate and it was beautiful. Um, I think the whole the whole team walked away and Anne could speak on that as well. Just with a really positive vibe and feeling. Uh, so things are moving forward and things are looking up, which is great. With that said, does anybody have an announcement this morning? Anne Ellis. So anyone from church community who's in church Perfect. I don't think Ashley's upstairs yet, but I also believe that there is a quick post church meeting for um, anybody that's going to help out with the Easter program that we're going to do, uh, Easter egg hunt and whatnot for the local community. So if you're not part of the search committee, head downstairs and volunteer for that too, because we would love it. Ash Wednesday, the meal is at 6 30? No. 6? 6 o'clock for soup. 6 o'clock for soup, and service will be at 7 o'clock up here. And we have myself, and there will be three uh, pastors from local uh, churches who will be leading the Ash Wednesday service. So please join us. Uh, we'd love for you to see everybody. Just briefly, don't forget, we still have the ShopRite and Weiss gift cards. When you buy one, it, you get the full price, but the, the church gets back 5% of that. So we all have to go to shop right or rice or something like that. So get your cards. Thank you. <coughs> Perfect. <coughs> Anybody else? Awesome. Everybody take a deep breath and center yourself for our worship.
Join me in our call to worship. Seek God, know God, trust God, O oh people. Sing praise, praise to the Lord, 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 Lord. Declare God's deeds among the people. Sing praise to the Lord. The needy are remembered and the poor have hope. Sing praise to the Lord. Center us, O God, to worship you this day. Remove our feet with song. Give us your humble. Grant us song. Give us joyful hearts for your hands, that we may be open to your grace. Amen. You can stand if you're able and join us in hymn number 73 for worship today. Between Sokha and Ezekiah. 
Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up the battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one, occupied one hill and the Israelites the other, with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. <coughs> He had bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale of armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels, and his legs he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and his iron fork weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up in the battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' word, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David was the son of the Ephraim named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The first prompt, the firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, Abinadab, and David went back and forth. I'm sorry, the third was Shem. David was the youngest, the three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistines came forward every morning and evening and took his stick. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take the Ephraim, a roasted grain, and take ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of the army. See him. <clears throat> See how your brother. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of the shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed him. He reached the camp of the army as he was going out to battle, as he was going out to his battle position, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things and the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking to them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out of his lines and shouted out his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. <laughs> now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what had been saying, and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave these few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch us die in battle. Now what have I done, said David, can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up, brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and David and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine, your servant. We will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. 
If it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hands of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put on a coat of armor and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and was tired walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off, and then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the riverbed, and in the pouch of the shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his hood. Come here, he said, and I will give you for your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. So all those who gather here will know that it is not by the sword or spear that the Lord saved you. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag, he took out a stone, he slung it, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. So David triumphed over this Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and threw it from his sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistine to the entrance of Gath and the gates of Ekron. Their dead was strewn along the Sharaham road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put, it, he put the Philistines' weapons in his own bed. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistines, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, as surely as we live, your majesty, I don't know. The king said, find out, and whose son that you get that young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? asked Saul. David said, I am the son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem. Here is the reading of the word. I want to thank my young ones today. <laughs> David versus Goliath. I think we've all heard that story countless times throughout our faith, education, upbringing, and uh, lives. It's a biblical underdog story for all the time. Being an avid sports fan that I am, uh, and an observer of almost every major event that goes on, and as Sarah would attest, uh, a lot of the unmajor sporting events that happen, I hear the phrase all the time. When the little guy plays the big bad guy. USA versus the big red, red machine in hockey back in 1980s, probably the most famous David versus Goliath story. Collegiate kids from the States going toe to toe with the biggest and baddest hockey team the world had ever seen for Olympic glory. Facing off after getting bludgeoned by the Soviets weeks prior, the American kids came out on top and slayed the giant. 
Or how about when lowly Appalachian State went to the big house in Michigan to do battle on a Saturday back in 2003. Michigan football was the cream of the crop and ranked number five in the country at the time. And App State was just a lowly Division I, two double A school, which is virtually the minor leagues of college football. App State won the game after being paid $400,000 by Michigan to travel there for a pup game. Faith in themselves and not their public perception set the Mountaineers to victory. They too slayed the giant. These are underdog stories through and through, celebrated and referenced any time a team lesser than is starting to look like they have a chance against a vaunted opponent. This all comes and stems directly from our passage today. David vs. Goliath has been weaved into our lexicon over the years in reverence to the greatest underdog story ever told. And we talked about it last week. We see these 40 days, that, that special biblical number, come into play again tonight. 1 Samuel 17, 16 says, For 40 days, Goliath and the Philistines would stand up and insult the Israelite army every morning and every evening. For 40 days, Goliath taunted the Israelites, and Saul was afraid to send someone to fight him. Fight him. Who wouldn't be afraid of a man nine feet tall, cloaked in 125 pounds of armor? More armor than what most of those Israelites probably weighed. I get it, but this is where faith comes into play. Saul, leader of the Israelite army, lost his faith in God. In turn, he made him lose his faith in himself and the men that he led. He lost their, they lost their faith in him and themselves, and nobody would volunteer for this doomed battle in front of them. They feared death, they feared slavery, and it was too much for anyone to pick up a sword and do battle. So taunted they were for 40 days and 40 nights. We've all been taunted in our times on earth, both in our faith and our physical selves. I think of those with cancers or degenerative illnesses, and the taunting must feel never-ending and like such a burden. Yet we see countless times those around us that face it head-on, pick up a sword and do battle with an evil thing. It's a battle that is scary and a battle that is all, not won nearly often enough. If those real-life Davids battling that can find it in them, then we too can search and find our faith and place it where it is needed. Sometimes we have a hard time as people figuring out where to place our faith, but we obviously have been told time and time again where we should place it. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. John 6.35 says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 5 says, I did this so that your faith might not depend on the wisdom of people, but on the power of God. It is faith that led David to fight for his people when not a single other person would. And David wasn't the ideal candidate to take up this fight. He wasn't even a soldier. He was sent there to feed soldiers. God shows us time and time again, though, that sometimes the right person for the job is not the one we expect. Jonah escaped the sea beast to save the people of Nineveh after attempting to flee, but God still used him. Esther was orphaned, adopted, and one day would eventually become queen and save Israel. David was not as ordinary as these folks. He had secretly, not so secretly, but anointed king and waited, of course. Saul had fallen out of favor with God during this. And we learned that in chapter 15 of Samuel a little bit earlier. 1 Samuel 15, 10 and 11. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. He lost his faith in God. This is not to David's knowledge yet, but Samuel would eventually be sent by God to David's father and be shown David as that new king. 
which makes this moment in David's life all so much more important and special. He shows his courage. He shows his faith. Goliath was the alpha male of all alpha males. David was just a boy. Was even called that by Saul in verse 42. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy. David had no experience in combat. Wearing the armor made it virtually impossible for him to move. And as a tender of sheep, he was used to protecting a flock. David, as a young man, had to deal with bears and lions by himself, and not with those handy tools that we have today when animals come to our farms. David wasn't stronger than his animals, but he was shaped to focus on God. The wildlife and changing seasons of these animals and landscapes surrounding Bethlehem instilled a deep sense of reliance on God and his faith for protection. Verses 34 through 37 of today's script. David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear carried, came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. David knows he has no real reason for victory over these animals, but he knew that God delivered them. Which with that kind of reasoning leads us to better understanding as to why the young man of no great value, no great stature yet, would be willing to put his life on the line for his flock of Israelites. Verse 45, you come to me with a sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Luke chapter 1, verse 37, with God, nothing shall be impossible. With all of his faith in the Lord, with all of his strength conjured up in his deep sense of trust in God, David does go on to slay the lion, and deliver victory for God and his people. But let's broaden that out. What is Goliath in today's world? What is David? I look at Goliath and I see sin and Satan. I see a person who brought the Philistines to worship the false gods. I see sin. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Goliath was bad company. Goliath is, sins that need, is sin that needs to be defeated to glorify 